Oh, that's good. That's a good. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. really good. All right. Now, you let me know when you're ready, and I'm going to start the audio. Okay. Is it coming up blurry? Um, it is. There we go. There we go. Yep, we got it. And I'm going to send you the video as well. That way okay. you can post it. Now, do you have any software, uh, video editing software? Um, but, okay. but, but yours is probably better. No, mine isn't. No, it's the... <laughs> 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 I just started buying all this stuff, so. All right, so you can start when that, let me make sure that audio is running. Wrong shirt on today. <laughs> I could have got the wrong shirt. Okay. All right. Whenever you're ready. This is running right now, right? It is running. Okay, mm -hmm. good. And I will start mine as well. You're on. All right. What's up, everybody? I am Coach Mo, and I am so excited to be here today, sitting in for the amazing Ron Holland. I cannot say how excited I am about this opportunity, but especially for this topic today, uh, because what we're talking about today is racism, sexism, bias, and why, <coughs> why black women's health is failing. <laughs> to help us get through these muddy waters, I have board certified internal medicine, family medicine physician, Dr. Monique May. How are you today? I am good, Mo. How are you? Good I am, job. Well, thank you. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about yourself today. Sure. Well, as you said, I'm a board certified family physician with over 20 years of clinical practice. Um, I'm currently working in an administrative role. Um, and in my spare time, I'm also known as a physician in the kitchen. And through my home meal delivery service, cookbooks and cooking utensils, I help busy households enjoy healthy eating with unpacking their hectic schedules. Excellent. So not only do we have an expert in the room, we also have an expert cook as well <laughs> to help us when we get to the, to the part about uh, why is self, how are we to blame uh, for our failing health. And so I wanted to by saying why this topic is so important to me. Uh, I have a friend who, uh, she went to the doctor she told the doctor, hey, my heart is beating too fast. And he said, oh, you're okay. She looked like the perfect picture of health. Perfect picture of health. She, perfect weight, beautiful girl. He said, you're fine. And so he sent her away. Then she said, she came back again and she said, my heart is beating too fast. I can see it pulsating in my neck. And he did some blood work and he said, you're fine. And so he sent her away again. She ended up collapsing in her kitchen, uh, total heart failure. She is not here today. And so this show not only is dedicated to her, but just to talk about how and why are physicians missing the mark on identifying issues, diagnosing women appropriately. Why are we dying at these high rates? Why are our prognosis so much worse than others? So we've got to get to the bottom of it. Uh, this is a life and death death conversation so we've got to have it we've got to talk about it but more importantly we've got to figure out some solutions today because this cannot continue to happen before we start the finger pointing I want to just first talk about the three uh, health care the biggest health care uh, we have with black women so tell us about those three major killers well definitely and, and first of all I'm I, on behalf of all the good doctors out there I do I, I my heart just goes out to your friend and her family and um, because um, that, that is truly um, just tragic to hear. But as far as the most common um, and probably deadliest uh, conditions that we see, definitely cancer, heart disease, and diabetes are on the top of those that list um, because a lot of those are, a lot of that can be impacted by lifestyle as well as hereditary conditions. Okay, and I want to talk about uh, heart disease. So I know that for black women, heart disease, we are 50% more likely to die or be diagnosed with heart. A lot of that is also caused by stress. So can you tell us a little bit about the stress and how that impacts black women? Certainly. So as, as women in general, and certainly as black women, we tend to put others before ourselves. 
And so that means we're, we're constantly giving, constantly pouring out to others. And sometimes that's at the, the expense of our own health, where we may not be paying attention to those warning signs, to, as Oprah calls it, those the, the whispers mm -hmm. that comes before the, the whole brick wall falls, falls in on you from serious complications. So I think it's part of just this superwoman mentality that we sometimes have, uh, or our trust and our faith that everything okay and we may not seek the care and attention that we need from the medical field or the medical profession in time and so from your perspective how does the medical community or physicians sometimes miss the mark when when black women come in and they say that hey you know my heart is beating fast or hey you know I'm short short of breath how does it happen that uh, a medical professional would miss that well, that, that, that's a very good question. Um, I think some of it we look at, we, we're trained. Part of it goes back to our training. To look for when you when you hear um, hoofbeats, think horses and not zebras. And so we take into account a lot of different, like the age of the patient, the family history, the social history, meaning is the person a smoker or engaging in other high risk activities that may predispose them to one thing over another. Uh, but the I learned back in medical school many years ago that you should be able to make about 90% of your diagnoses from the history alone. So if you're taking a good history and addressing or asking the right questions, and if the patient is also honest in telling you what symptoms she's having, what medical problems are in the family or what that she's had herself, you should be able to come to a fairly good idea of what you're looking for before you start running all the tests. So it's... Um, it, it's a combination of taking the time to to hear the patient, for, to hear the patient, and that is that is so key, um, and to really be able to narrow down and not just rule out or assume that some racial groups don't feel pain the same way, or imagine, well, it can't be that bad because she looks a certain way. Um, if I if I may just briefly, there was a, a study that came out over 20 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine where they actually looked at doctors. Um, they presented the same scenario with chest pain in black men, black women and black men, white women and white men, and um, black women. At the end of that study, black women were less likely to be referred for cardiac catheterization, which is a test for blockages of the arteries, with the same symptom presentations as the other groups. And do you think that that still happens today? Because when when black women present in the hospital, studies have shown that they are least likely to receive pain medication. Uh, they are least likely, their pain is not always viewed the same, uh, and they're most likely to be sent away before they receive appropriate care. The knee jerk was to say, okay, well, the reason black women are receiving less care is because of their socioeconomic status. So that almost fell into a implicit bias to say black women are poor, and that's why they're not getting the appropriate care, or they don't have access to care. However, uh, with, especially within the last three years, they're finding that that is not true because the outcomes for black women and their care is the exact same and the outcome is the exact same for all women across the board. So there have been few studies done on black women who are middle class, who are having these same terrible outcomes uh, as women who may be of a, a low socioeconomic status. One study also showed that a college has a least likely chance to have a healthy delivery than a white woman who has a, a high school diploma. So the disparity in healthcare is shocking. It is it is shocking and it has we have to have these conversations. Uh, so I want to talk about racism in healthcare and, and bias in, in healthcare. So I've been reading this book which has kept me up at night thanks to you Dr. <laughs> Monique. Uh, it is uh, medical apartheid and they are talking about how Black women and black people especially have been used since slavery for experimental studies. And you would immediately think like, oh, that doesn't happen now. That was 1840. They were doing these surgeries and procedures on slaves and it doesn't happen now. But even when we fast forward, 1998, they were doing experimental studies on black and Hispanic boys in New York City uh, to see if they were inherently uh, aggressive. Fast forward to the Depo Vera shot. That was also uh, experimental. And so I want to talk about racism in healthcare. So when a black woman presents in, in a hospital setting and they say, hey, I'm, I'm short of breath, or hey, I'm having these issues, how does that racism and unconscious bias come into play? And have you seen that from your peers? 
So it kind of goes back to, to what I was saying earlier about the New England Journal study, but um, even with the same symptoms, a certain subset of physicians, and again, this is not disparaging all physicians by any means, but there are um, a subset of physicians who will look at a black woman and not take her symptoms as seriously. Um, and yes, I mean, as far as what I've seen in my career, um, I, I'll use, for example, hysterectomy rates. Um, when I was, I did family medicine for over 15 years, and in that time, I was privileged to care for a lot of women in their reproductive ages, in their reproductive years. And fibroids, which is a fortunately a non-cancer, is very rarely does that become a cancerous tumor um, of the uterus, is more common in black women. But more often than not, I noticed over the years that these women were coming in and had either had hysterectomies or were being told that they needed hysterectomies. Now, for those who, who may not know, fibroids can cause, if they're large enough, because of their position in the uterus, can mimic the symptoms of, of almost being pregnant. Pre constant pressure on the bladder, um, just a fullness, discomfort in the pelvis, um, can affect your sexual um, performance and, and other things. If, depending on where they are and how large they are, surgery may in fact only be the option. But what I did not appreciate and what I did not understand was why these women were not being told about other options that were first first of all uterine sparing so if the woman wanted to go on to have children or just not subjected to a major operation which in and of itself it can be fraught with risks so that was definitely something that I noticed more over the years and a lot of there's been a lot of energy uh, around this topic uh, within the last couple of days there were so many women who were posting on my page about how often they were asked to, t to get a hysterectomy for fibroids. One person on my Facebook, and I was mortified, she said that she was sitting in her seat in the doctor's office and the doctor started to feel her, I guess even just from the outside, just filled her stomach and said, yeah, you need to get a hysterectomy. While she was sitting up. While she, she was sitting she up. She wasn't even While on she was the sitting table up. in the position, correct position. To exactly, be exactly. And so when I go back about how they were saying in this, in this book, how black women are asked to get hysterectomies uh, and then they talked about eugenics and things like that to stop the, the creation or procreation of, of, of more black children and black people. Uh, when you start to look at all of these things and how they tie in, why do you think that black women are being asked to get hysterectomies 60% more than white women? Well, you know, I, I, I hate to, you know, eugenics is that. It's, it's, it's touchy. It's touchy. It's touchy. It's touchy. And so it harkens to, to much, um, much more malicious intent that, that may actually be in play. But honestly, I think it's, 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 it's ease. It's, it's a procedure, first of all. So, you know, I, I think I'd rather call someone greedy versus um, wanting to, to, to be mm -hmm. malicious. But, which in and of itself, of course, is not good, but, um, you know, there's a higher cost to doing surgery than giving another a non-operative um, procedure. Um, and also, it could just be the, the training that the physician has, has received, and that's kind of what they know, and that's what they're more comfortable with, versus um, some of the more newer techniques. But, I mean, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that that trend is, is improving because of the other techniques that are available. But as I used to tell my patients, if, if the GYN is only telling you surgery, please go get a second, third, and even fourth opinion because, again, every woman is different, but there may be other options. And, I, and I'm glad that you pointed on that um, and talked about that a bit. I was actually diagnosed, and I say that with air quotes, with fibroids. And so it was, for me, it was really odd because fibroids is not, I don't have a family history really of fibroids and, you know, I don't do caffeine and all of these things. It was just very odd for my situation. So I, the doctor, he was going to give me a, a procedure at a, a specific facility and I wasn't comfortable getting my procedure done at that facility. So he, you know, he said, well, you know, I can't do it anywhere else. Let's find another doctor, which I did. And so when I found the other doctor, uh, she said, okay, well, before we do your surgery, we have to uh, do a re-exam. We have to re-examine you so we can find the location of the fibroid. So I was a little annoyed because I'm like, oh, okay, now I've got to go through another re-examination. And so we went through the re-examination. She said, I don't see fibroids here. And I said, well, no, I have a surgery scheduled for February 26th. They're, they're fibroids. She said, well, let me do a more invasive procedure just to see. And she came back and she said, mm, no. There are absolutely no fibroids, and I just checked your chart, 
and they didn't have in there that it was definite fibroids. It was a possibility of fibroids. And so in that moment, I was furious because I realized as knowledgeable as I am in healthcare, I was in a situation where I was about to have a surgery for fibroids and fibroids did not even exist. Uh, because greed does come into play. That was would have been about a $10,000 surgery um, for something that didn't exist. And so in that moment, I realized we as women have to be serious advocates of our health care. And so I want to talk about how, because we understand that racism exists. We cannot think that when we go to our doctor, if they are racist or they have these major unconscious biases everywhere else in their life, that it's going to stop when they walk into work. That is not the reality. If they have these unconscious biases, these implicit biases, or racism is a factor, it is going to exist when they're examining you. So I want to talk for a moment about how we as black women need to be better advocates. And I also want to touch on something that, you know, is very much a culture thing with us. We love to be thick. We love big booties, we love thighs, we love all of these, you know, the extra curves. And what we don't realize is that could be killing us because we start to fall outside of the healthy weight range. So I wanna just talk about that, um, just a healthy weight range and how can we find that balance between the curves, the big booty, the thighs, and still be healthy? Well, that, that's a great question, but as far as your, your first question about uh, what can we do, as far as being our own advocates, and that is a point that I, I want to scream from the mountaintops because um, I, when I was in practice, I expected patients to be part of the team. I was the coach, but you, you have to, as a patient, take the ball and run with it. So part of advocacy for yourself is asking questions, asking questions, being informed, so that you can truly make an informed decision. And if, you, if something doesn't feel right, listen to that spirit. People are very intuitive. And sometimes we kind of push that little voice away and say, oh, no, I'm being oversensitive or I'm overreacting. Don't. If you have, if something doesn't feel right, ask about it. And even ask the, the physician, would you recommend this if this was your mother or your sister or your wife? Mm -hmm. And if you, you can use that to respond to you as a barometer to see if that coincides with what that little voice is telling you. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's good. And there are so many women who will say that, you know, I'm not comfortable saying no to my doctor because because my doctor, you know, they went to school for this. They know that. Ladies, I cannot say enough. You are with your body every single day. You know your body better than any physician will ever know their body. There was one article I was reading in which a woman, she, uh, she kept going back to the doctor because she kept saying, you know, my knees hurt, my knees hurt. And they kept saying, oh, it's weight related. It is weight related. That's why your knees hurt. It's weight related. Um, but she knew her body enough to say this is not weight related. She was having two tumors and had to have two knee replacements at 30, around 30 years old. And so that's why it is critical to say if you feel something is wrong, you cannot stop with the doctor's one opinion. Get one opinion, get two opinions, get three opinions. Had I not gotten a second opinion, I've had a surgery for no fibroids. Wow. That is how critical it is that you have to stand up and be an advocate for yourself. I think about the story with Serena Williams. When she delivered her baby, she kept saying something is wrong, something is wrong, and they kept ignoring her. That goes back to this is not socioeconomic related, but she kept saying something is wrong. She had blood clots, and had she not screamed that and demanded that they look again, she would have died. She would have died. So these continue to happen. So thank you for saying that because we, we've got to speak up for ourselves. Um, and so I want to talk about how do we find that healthy balance between big booty and a smile or uh, being healthy? How do we find that balance? So again, uh, great question. And, and I'm going to try not to step on too many. But um, we, we talk about um, health. And, and it, it, that is somewhat of a relative term. Uh, by no means are we saying that everyone needs to be a size zero to six, because that's just not how we are made. But at the other end of the spectrum, you don't need to have the extra weight as, as well. And so it also depends on where you carry your weight. Uh, for example, what we call central adiposity, or the weight that's around the waist, tends to be higher risk, because if you think about it, that same fat that you're carrying around your waist is encasing can be encasing your, your organs and making your heart 
have to work harder. So versus fat that you may tend to carry in your hips, which is not as uh, not thought to be as high of a risk. But you, it, women need to work with your doctor to determine what's the best, healthiest weight for them. We talk in terms of body mass index, which is a ratio of your height to weight. And typically 20 to 25 is normal. Uh, 26 to 29 is overweight. And then starting at 30 is when we start defining obesity and it goes up from there. So, but depending on if a person is muscular, that, so someone like Serena Williams, I would guess, was probably technically obese because she's so muscular. So that's not a valid um, measure for her. So there are other things like your waist circumference um, that we look at again to see where you tend to carry your weight. Okay, that that's good. And I'm glad you mentioned that because every time we go, and I don't know really any women who fall in that weight range that the doctors give you we are all morbidly obese pretty much most women according to that according to the chart that they give so thank you for saying that that there are other uh options or options to assess appropriate body weight i also want to just take a second to address this we have got to get out of the prayer closet the prayer closet is killing us i remember years ago were two women who had come into this wellness facility and they both visually they were morbidly obese and so the nurse started to share with them hey you know you know you are at a very unhealthy weight you, your blood pressure is elevated and the women start both women saying to this nurse she was a white woman did not understand this cultural lingo that we have both women started saying devil is a lie you won't speak that in my life you won't speak that in my life and so she pulled me to the side and she was in a panic and she said mo why are they calling me the devil i said no i said they're not calling you the devil this is a religious thing that we have so let's talk about how religion because that's self we're, this is this is self-imposed we're putting this on ourselves. what can we do to balance religion just saying jesus will take care of it and making sure we take care of ourselves. Jesus will take care of it, but he also expects us, <laughs> expects us to take care of ourselves as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and the patients used to always, it was just, you know, they would come to me for their knee pain or back pain, but when I pressure, oh no, I'm not claiming that, and Jesus yeah. got it. So <laughs> Jesus can take care of your blood pressure, but he can't take care of your knee pain. Exactly. I, I think it's just a a, a matter of, of education and being, a, being aware that it's not, either or it's both it's both you can still have your faith and you can still take your blood pressure medicine that the doctor is telling you absolutely and start making changes that you might can even get off of the medication if you start to change your behaviors a lot of the morbidity illness that we see in this country is lifestyle and so it, if you can modify it's all about modifying what you can you can't change your family history you can't change your age you can't change your race but you can change what you're putting in your body, how, how much exercise you're getting. And so, and, it, and nothing about that says prayer will go along with that. You just have to be um, informed and, and an intelligent consumer of health care. Absolutely. So what we're saying is Jesus and your medication. There you go. Jesus and the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're saying, that's what we're saying. So before we go, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. This was great information. So before we go, the one thing I have to say is, ladies, it is true, you can't have a doctor who has unconscious bias. You can't have a doctor who is raised and is not on your best behalf. That is the honest truth. But you have to be an advocate for yourself. If it doesn't feel right, and, and don't wait too long. Black women, too, too often we will wait for a very long time. We'll go in, our whole arm is falling off. And we'll say, oh, I'll, I'll take care of it tomorrow. I've gotta go pick up the kids, I've gotta do this. When we feel something, do something. Nice parting words of advice parting that you words, have yes, for us. Yes, because this has been great. And I hope it's been informative. Um, basically, repeat how important it is to be able to partner with a physician that you trust. Partner. Because there are a lot of great physicians out there who truly want the best and do the best for their patients. And it also speaks to the need in healthcare because when we see people who look like us it, it brings down barriers as well mm -hmm. so partner with someone you can trust if you can't trust that person you don't feel like you can be honest find someone else uh, also don't be afraid to ask questions like we said before because um, you need to have the answer when you leave that doctor's office you should be able to explain what is going on with you what is the plan and what to do if things do not proceed as anticipated um, and on the flip side of that be sure to be honest when we ask you questions in turn and lastly, family history.
ministry. We are all about to break bread with our family and loved ones on Thursday. And I can't think of a better time to talk about family history. Um, you kind of going back to what you said. Ooh, it's touchy. <laughs> talking about what you said about Jesus and prayer, but also knowing your family history because the just you know, people are dying from from diseases that again can have a hereditary component, and um, knowing what you can do whether it's getting your colon cancer screening ten years earlier than what we recommend at age fifty, or getting your mammograms earlier than what we typically recommend. Any of that. Um, I just briefly want to mention um, Maya Rockymore Cummings. The widow of Elijah Cummings just this past I think maybe two Fridays ago had a prophylactic mis bilateral mastectomy because of her and tell us what that is and that's where she had both of her breasts removed before the diagnosis of cancer because her family history was so scary her she lost her mother and um, she has a sister who I believe is um, diagnosed with advanced cancer so in anticipation of her political um, campaign she wanted to be healthy so she took the, the step of having that done so as you all are passing that the, that's the family history chart as well, well, then. well and, then. and and really have these open and honest conversations because silence is killing us love it love it well thank you so much you have given us some great great takeaways for today but most importantly this is going to save somebody's life so if your doctor is not working on find somebody else. If they are uncomfortable with answering your questions, find someone else. If they are rushing you and they want to keep you, do that, stick to that seven minutes, 7.5 minutes, go find someone else. Be an advocate. You know your body better than anybody else will know your body. Be an advocate for yourself. I'll just leave with saying we've got to be happy, healthy, and whole. We only have this one life to live and we've got to live it as well as we can. So thank you so much, thank Dr. You. Monique. You have been amazing. And again, thank you to Ron Holland for allowing us to take over his studio for, for this, this opportunity. So thank you so much. Okay. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, I'll wrap up the show. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'll go ahead and wrap up the show. This is Community Voices. This is Community Voices um, with, uh, with Ron with Holland. Ron we'll be back in we'll a moment. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. There Thank you so much. That was great. Oh, that was. That was very good. That was very good. good. <laughs> my heart was like, and then Why? once we started, I was like, oh, yeah. this is cool. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, but exactly. So this yeah. is, I think this is going to help a lot of people. Oh, one second, ladies. Let me save this real quick. And then if I'm going to have you do something, uh, give me one second. I'm going to write this out. I'm going to need you to save this. Oh, you know, let me stop that. Oh, you can just yeah, yeah, you can stop. Okay. Mm -hmm.